an American dream of chocolate milk. So this is a little snapshot really from the 70s. Um, an American dream of chocolate milk. There's a photograph of me at three years old in the Kauai bush with my father engaged in black robin research for the New Zealand Wildlife Service. I'm wearing, wearing an exuberant smile, like there's something innately joyful about everything happening in that moment. Like I just dropped in from a birthday party into the forest next to a bird being gently banded to be carefully tracked by my father, Doug Flack. At the time of the photo, this bird is literally on the verge of extinction, which is by any measure a serious situation. Although my father's job was serious, he too had a sense of humor which may have given him the creativity and energy required to perform his best work at that time as a scientist and simultaneously as a parent. My father's bird research required that he journey to remote, wind-swept, uninhabited islands in the archipelago of Aotearoa. This meant getting dropped by boat at the base of a towering cliff which he'd climb up without any high-tech gear. One time, the waves were so big and relentless that before reaching the island, his boat was about to be overturned. There weren't enough life vests for everyone, and one man could not swim. My father gave his life vest to that man. He's never been fussy about choosing the safe path in life, maybe because, like with building a good fence, he's always had his vision clearly aligned with where he's going. So everyone made it out of the waves that day, reached the cliff, and up they went to where he'd set his sights on saving the Chatham Island Black Robin. By the way, there's a happy ending to the New Zealand bird story. Thanks to the diligence of my father and those who followed him, the Black Robin did not go extinct and is now thriving. Which, <laughs> which brings me to the next place where my father set his sights regenerative grass farming in Vermont, which at the time was actually called mob stalking or voisin grazing, named after a Frenchman. So we began our journey to the other side of the world, to the land of green mountains. Like all of life, this story is a snapshot in time, the origin of a larger story. And since I'm the teller, I'll give you a snapshot funny version. And I actually kept cutting this down and cutting this down. <laughs> There are mental images our associative mind collects, stores, and highlights. One of those images is me at five years old in Miami, Florida. It's the late 1970s, and I have just disembarked from three weeks crossing the Pacific from New Zealand on the last round-the-world passenger ship. The Australis, originally named America, was designed to carry immigrants and christened by Eleanor Roosevelt. This is nearly its final voyage. But on that day, I don't care about boat history. I've left everything I know behind, and I'm standing in the bright sunshine in my new home country, drinking chocolate milk from a box. It's the beginning of my story <laughs> and the middle of my parents' story. There's a history, drama, adventure, and comedy concurrently unfolding under the Florida sun. Firstly, I'm completely amazed because I can't believe there's such a thing as chocolate milk from a box. This image is inextricably associated with arriving in the United States of America. Simultaneously, of less immediate interest to me, is that I'm waiting for my mother who is being detained for questioning by immigration officials, not allowed to enter the United States. Although I have been given permission to cross the threshold into the land of chocolate milk from a box, my mother has not received the same hall pass. My dad is an American citizen, but at the time, my mother is not. Her British passport shows she visited China before the open door policy with the United States. So by associative deduction, they suspect, wait for it, she's a communist. <laughs> It took time and persuasion for my mother to be released, including a written dissertation to be handed in before her acceptance, describing why she was not a communist. 
if they only realized that she, like many immigrants, was coming to America for the capitalist opportunities accessible to her, choices not nearly as available to a woman with a PhD elsewhere in most countries at the time. This was a place she might be able to have the professional career as an academic she envisioned. To get here, she needed to be resilient, keep calm, and carry on. We finally arrived in Vermont, where it was snowy and cold. We didn't have a house, so we moved in with friends. My parents had bought raw land before our arrival in Vermont and were making a monthly payment to a local farm family for it. We moved to Vermont to farm, create community as a healthy place to grow up and flourish. My parents liked some of the western states as well, but didn't want to live in a drought area or fire-adapted ecosystem. We were packed into a well-worn farmhouse with another family and a Vietnam veteran suffering from PTSD. I created silly jokes that sometimes made him laugh. This close quarters living situation with eight people was tight. So by March, we were living in tents on our land with plenty of snow still on the ground. I had my own tent with all my stuffed animals on one side who'd also traveled from the other side of the world. My parents built an open lean-to next to our fire pit where we'd eat and wash our dishes in a large metal bowl. Since bathing was of no priority to my sister and I, and we didn't require Wi-Fi, I absolutely loved this lifestyle. My parents were worried that we didn't have a house, but once again, like with the immigration issues, my parents' concerns were background noise compared to the adventure story I was living. On a daily basis, I was witnessing their resilience expressed as creativity in action. At the time, there was no specialty ice cream, no craft beer, no artisanal cheese, and great bread had to be purchased over the border in Montreal. The regenerative farming, or voisin grazing, we were doing was just a weird foreign idea, maybe even a socialist idea. Case in point, André Voisin was studying and writing about it in the 1950s in Europe and Cuba. Aha, very suspect. Possible immigration checklist. What, what was this grazing that was happening? Were the sheep communists as well? And was my mother buying enough chocolate milk from a box and other such essential items to demonstrate supporting proper capitalist consumer values? My parents were renegades in ways no government would truly appreciate, communist, socialist, or capitalist. Resilient skills acquired during my first American school year included observing and collecting data on standard government surveillance. I was having fun surveilling the surveiller. Mummy, who's that strange man following us again? That's just the FBI man, she'd say brightly while we were shopping at the grocery store. I learned that British cheerfulness, even when slightly forced, like a Monty Python skit, was a reasonable way to handle uncertainty. Rural Vermont must have been a pretty boring detail for a government agent to be assigned to, unless, of course, he'd been watching the open fire pit canning that my mother had been doing. Except that I knew my mother could be booted for any number of reasons. When fall came, my sister and I were a cultural variance in our town. Two scruffy children with funny accents bursting out of the woods, seemingly from nowhere, to catch the school bus. My sister brought a pet rat and a snake to school, hidden in her shirt, to scare the boys. We were renegades in ways no school could appreciate. Truly, though, I just wanted to be like those others in my new culture, but when I opened my mouth, I did not sound the same. Almost nobody around me had ever heard my accent because it wasn't American English. Even my first name was often considered unpronounceable. Right away, I noticed American culture's obsession with reducing every name to one syllable. When we finally finished building our house, our composting toilet was a bit of a standout. I just wanted to be part of the flush toilet culture, fit in around town with other Americans and their plumbing, waste some water, perhaps even have a mother who canned while fully dressed. But we had a, but we had a fiber class 10 by 5 foot effluent processing box that sat in our basement with an orange toilet seat above. 
Kids like to visit just to see it. This non-flush composting toilet was a black hole that we sat upon. The composted strata, strata was a kind of goopy archaeology to me. My father was a hero to me back then, cleaning out the strata box every few years wearing a rain jacket. <laughs> it's the middle of my story now. A family, a house with multiple flush toilets, a couple of unruly sheep ruminating on our porch, a mountain maple syrup business, a meditation center, a fridge full of local cheese and meat and raw milk, of course. I still do love chocolate milk from a box, arriving in strange new cultures and sleeping in tents. Thankfully, I gave up trying to fit into any one culture, country, community, or philosophy and decided I could be all of it. From my parents, I received many gifts, courage to create my own path, imagination to envision what can be, and a desire to improve conditions around me wherever possible. The raw milk theater is actually the remaining section of the house that was connected to it right over there that we briefly first stayed in all those years ago. So whenever I come to raw milk theater, I think about that. We first stayed on the house that was attached right over there. Um, so, and that house contained a composting toilet as well. So I never would have imagined that from the ashes would rise a theater, a place for a community such as this to gather, share, and connect. Thank you to my dad and Bobby for founding this great theater and to everyone who has supported it and participated over the years. May it continue to thrive. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Gwyneth. <clears throat> and I want to ride on her coattails a little bit. I want to thank Doug and Bobby. You know, they've put a lot of vision into this space and this event and this infrastructure. And we are so privileged to um, be able to carry that forward. So I want to thank them for all that love, all the years, all the effort to make Raw Milk Theater happen. We hope to make you proud by taking it forward into the future. Thank you, Doug and Bobby.